This is Drowning in Data, but Thirsty for Insights. My name is Benjamin Nussbaum. Uh, my background is in software engineering, architecture, design of globally distributed systems, understanding how to leverage a <coughs> different components within a data architecture to maximize the you know, value from that a specific piece. So I've been doing this for about 20 years, started in SQL, and then kind of big data, no SQL, and then spent a lot of my time in graph now. Uh, all through that focused on how do we deliver value for the business based on the technology investments that are being made. So to date, about $100 billion has been spent on big data. Big data has been trending for a while, and it encompasses um, you know, much of what are the data lakes, the data warehouses of today built on Hadoop, pushing a lot of data into it. And what I've seen and what others that I've talked to have seen is that there's kind of been this misconception, misunderstanding around the value that would come from those big data investments. If we have many, you know, systems of record, operational systems within our, you know, different departments across an enterprise, and we move them into a data lake or to a data warehouse, and we do this big data, this big investment, you know, to stand up Hadoop and, and move all this data to this logical location. Well, it's a bit of a fallacy because we haven't actually moved, done anything different with the data. We've simply taken the data from the silo, the specific database where it was, and we put it in a logical location with the intent to get value from it uh, in the future at some other point. But even within a data lake or a data warehouse, data largely still remains uh, isolated uh, and in those silos. As part of that process, there often isn't you know, a step to go ahead and connect it. And when that data uh, hasn't been connected and it remains there, it's up to the data analyst or the data scientist to you know, then leverage uh, the data warehouse, the tooling uh, you know, within the ecosystem to try to bring that together. And so a lot of the, the fanfare and the promise of, of big data uh, kind of left a lot of most enterprises or a lot of enterprises underwhelmed with the actual measurable return on, on that investment. Um, and now as uh, you know, GDPR has come out, a lot of those data lakes have become a you know, liability uh, because you have a lot of customer data, but not as much uh, understanding of what's in them because we just Collectively, we all just went and put everything into the data lake. Um, big data kind of became a trend roughly in 2005. And when you hear big data, it's largely referring to the Hadoop ecosystem, which is really around the HDFS storage. Um, I'm not getting, this isn't a technical talk, but I'm just going to kind of cover the, the high level of what's there so that you know, on the business side of things, it's important for us to understand when you know, we hear our technical teams make certain statements like, I need to connect data together and from this source and this source and this source, well, what does that really mean? Um, and so, you know, with this, with Hadoop, what was really happening is we were taking uh, the ability to have many instances, many different nodes of storage and distribute that across. And then we had to do, uh, so that we could put, you know, terabytes and petabytes, et cetera, bytes of all of our data into it. And then we needed all of this tooling to be able to run jobs around it to try to bring that data together to derive some analytical value from that. And so emerged you know, massive investments in data warehouses, data lakes, uh, some new tooling around the business intelligence, but largely still uh, running into uh, performance pains on certain size of data. You know, Tableau starts to choke out when you're trying to connect too many things. It only go takes you so far. Uh, you know, for the different visualizations. And so a lot of the way that we're approaching analytics today and approaching deriving value is through putting data, or the, the way that we approach it with the big data trend is to put the data in the warehouse and assume that we'll get value out of it. Um, now, the one thing I will say is if, if you're not storing data at all in your data lake or your data warehouse is your system of record, that's great. You gotta get the data down, so at least capture it. But if you already have it in operational systems, uh, there's steps that are necessary beyond just putting it into a logical, a logical boundary of a data lake or a data warehouse. 
So what happens with the, with the data when we put it into that data lake um, or, the, or the data warehouse? What we, what we see is that you know, data it doesn't actually become more connected just by putting it in that logical location. What you still have are many pieces of data from the different sources that they originated. And now in order to actually do something with them, we have to use kind of these overlays to still bring them together, which in the SQL world, the big data world, those are all joins. We're using indexes to create the views of the data that we want to see and that we want to understand. And so, you know, this patchwork, it doesn't really scale because now you have individual, you've essentially pushed the onus onto an individual data scientist or analyst to go and find the data in the warehouse or the data lake that they want and bring it together themselves and wait for their job to finish and for it to be their interpretation of the data rather than taking the step as a business to say, let's understand the data that's here, understand what it means for the business and create a system for <clears throat> connecting that and representing that so that our data scientists and analysts don't have to connect it in a snapshot moment and then throw it away once they generate the report. Because then somebody's gonna come along later and have to connect it again to generate a different report. Uh, and so we just kind of go through this cycle of connect the data through these overlays joins and then generate some report, report it to the business, but throw all of that away instead of leaving it in that state for you know, further, uh, further usage. And so this is very time consuming. You know, when you have high value resources spending a lot of their time doing this, it gets expensive. You know, it's not even just the amount of time that it takes to stand up the infrastructure or the people that needed, <clears throat> are needed to support it. It's a lot of the analysts and data scientists' time. On the technical side, um, we all kind of have this affinity for, you know, big machines, large compute, big storage. Everybody gets a little giddy when you start talking about these, type, these concepts. Um, and so, you know, it, in the technical circles, it can become this thing where you're like, oh, well, we have a thousand of this type of server, and I run a, you know, cluster of that. And unfortunately, all of those terms, when you look at it from the business side, those are bad things. We want to be able to derive analytics and understand our data and our businesses with as little hardware as possible. Because the more there is to manage, the more personnel it takes, the more infrastructure we have to purchase. Um, and you know, from an engineering perspective, which I've been one for my whole career, uh, even though I understand the business side, what the, is often the case is this leads to very inefficient data representation. The more hardware that you have available, the easier it is to just say, oh, well this process that we do, you know, uh, takes a minute right now, but if we just threw 10 times more hardware at it, we could do it in 10 seconds, so let's just do that, instead of actually solving the real problem. Uh, of understanding why is it taking so long to you know, answer this question or to do this type of analytic. And so you know, from the business side, I always challenge the t our team whenever they come back to me and they say, well, you know, we just need to double the size of the instance that we're running on Amazon. We we'll just go from a you know, C4, uh, you know, two extra large to four extra large. I'm like, do we really need to do that? You know, let's understand why this process is, uh, is you know, inefficient and and try to be better about making it less efficient. So now we're in 2018, kind of 13 years into the big data trend. And we saw a recent change just in the past week with the merger between Hortonworks and uh, Cloudera. And you know, this is a, this is a, this stood out to me for a, for a few reasons. Um, you know, when you start looking at it, there's kind of a declining influence in Hadoop. You know, Hortonworks is largely an on-premise solution. Cloud has become much more desirable. It has much cheaper storage. So if you're just using object storage, you don't have to orchestrate or host anything. If you can deploy into cloud, whether it's you know, AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud, uh, it's much more cost effective. So you have to ask yourself in the big data assessment, if you're looking at a data lake, should I be standing up Hadoop or should I really just be using some cloud, some object storage? You know, the Google Cloud up here, uh, their layer that is Hadoop based is actually just a shim it just maps straight through to their object store because it's more cost effective for them to run their object store and to store the data there than to actually do a Hadoop deployment. And so a lot of the trend that we've seen is that instead of having these massive 
uh, databases in Hadoop and massive storage in that way. It's using object storage for your big files, but then if you have systems of record, use your you know, cloud scale databases kind of uh, in a unique manner and then deploy the application uh, infrastructure on the, for the container infrastructure. Um, and increasingly enterprises are looking to take the same approach. You know, everyone's, mo enterprises year over year are, have started to approve Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, a lot of these technologies that let us run containers, uh, be more nimble, less big investment, more, you know, start small and scale as it shows value. Um, you know, it's really difficult to do that when you're looking at a million plus upfront investment for getting a big data, Hadoop data lake just started. Um, you know, a lot of what we look for is our ways to test something, start small, and then increase it as it's actually showing value. Um, and so that's where, you know, we see that a lot of the, the numbers aren't very good. You know, only 15% of big data projects ever get to production, according to Gartner. And so we, we approach big data from, with kind of a, a perspective that uh, asks a lot of questions, let's say. Um, so if you've, if you've got the data warehouse today, there's, we're gonna talk about how you can extract value out of it, how you can get the, derive those insights in a cost-effective manner. Uh, if you're considering a data warehouse, we're gonna look at a few questions of when would you want to do that? And then uh, let's, so let's start, start with that. Um, so if you're doing a data warehouse only, or a data lake only for analytical value, you're gonna find yourself, in my perspective, I think you will struggle to get the return on that investment. Because a data lake and a data warehouse are not inherently uh, analytic, they don't inherently enable better analytics. Mostly what they do is create a logical aggregation of all of your data. So if you're already putting all of your data down on disk in different operational data stores, and you're only looking to get analytical value across all of those operational stores, putting them logically into a data warehouse isn't going to get you to analytical value faster. It'll just create an additional step where everything has to live and then you still have to connect those data stores in order to arrive at that value. If you're not able to get all your data down on disk today, then definitely start storing it. But don't just start storing it. If you can, come at it with a, an objective perspective to or from a data perspective, to understand the data that you're storing, how it's useful to the enterprise, and why you want to be putting that down on disk. And then determine the best format to put that down on disk, so that it can be reused, retrieved, for analytics and for decision making within your enterprise. And if you can leverage cloud storage, uh, by all means do it. Um, that's an important question. Anytime you can use it, use cloud storage, it'll let you start small and scale because you won't have to make that upfront hardware investment, the operations team, et cetera. You just cut out a lot of the costs as soon as you can do that. Um, and this last one I kind of touched on, or the second to last one I kind of touched on, but if you're just punting what you should do, and by that I mean, you, most of the time when we make decisions to do a big data lake implementation, you know, I, I've, I've been at the different, you know, enterprise data world, data architecture summit, I talked to a lot of people where, you know, over the last several years where they come and they're like, our company said we have to have a strategic initiative to implement Hadoop. You know, like, I hear that, I'm like, okay, well, that's not really a strategic initiative because that doesn't tell you, that's a, that, that's a tool, it's a technology. It doesn't tell you how you're going to get data or get value from that implementation. You know, a strategic initiative is, you know, today we can't look at this, this purchase order and tie it back to the supply chain that, of parts that, you know, we, that went into it. We need to be able to do that and answer that question in, you know, 10 seconds. Well, that's a strategic objective. Now, you can start to assess technologies from that perspective and say, is Hadoop the right, uh, right choice for that, or is there something else you know, we should be using? Um, and then the last one, if you're using this so you can connect multiple silos, um, there are better tools that we'll look at better approaches than just putting the data into a, into a data lake. Um, all right, so the cloud example. 
Cloud trans uh, really transformed the enterprise because of a few things. It removed the you know, non-differentiating IT infrastructure uh, costs from the internal purchase into a utility-based model. Whenever you can consume something as a utility and it's not your core business, it's to your advantage to do that um, because it lets you focus on what is your core business. And so this gives you a lot more speed and agility because if a server crashes, you don't have to replace it. You don't have to have the people and the persons to operate it. You can focus on what your, what your business is. Um, and in reality, you know, you buy what you need. It's tailored to your specific requirements. You get tech future-proofing because you don't have to cycle out hardware. Amazon, Azure, Google, they all do that and take on that burden. That's why they get to charge you for it. Um, and if you actually consider the cost of it per hour, it'll come out in your advantage because you don't have to have the personnel. And I, I guarantee you their security is better than your internal ITs. Uh, if you've looked at their SOC reports and uh, the steps that they take to secure their data centers because that's their job, that's their business, core business, um, it's better than, I would say, just about anybody's internal. So similarly for big data, if you don't have to deploy on-premise, it'll be a your advantage because you can start small, you can start with the data that you're pushing in, you get flexibility, and then as you know, your requirements change around that data, you can, be, you can take advantage of it. Uh, and then security that's constantly changing, and you want to be able to, to leverage that, uh, those changes. Ultimately, though, there's an evolution that needs to occur from big data to smart data. Because as the enterprises change, as we, everybody looks to have insights that their organizations are making decisions based off of, we need to go from what we see here where we're just aggregating data. You know, we've got, got the different silos. Even if it's in a data lake, it's still kind of separate, and we have to run those overlays. But we ultimately have to get it connected uh, so that we can have contextual understanding of what it means uh, and how to do that. Because only once we've mapped the data and we understand what's there, can we actually do discover, discovery and reasoning. A lot of AI and machine learning processes will just fall over on most data because it's not good data. Uh, and it wasn't really thought through what it means and how to work with it. So humans and machines need it connected in order to work with it effectively. The future is in connected data. I started working with connected data back in 2011, 2012, when I saw that I could map how the world existed around me, the interactions that we were having with customers, the interactions that the supply chain happened that was there, and just seeing how everything came together. I realized our world's one big set of, one big network. Everything is connected, whether it's me to my Starbucks coffee, uh, me to this conference, and there's context. And the basic premise is the edges represent the context of how, of the value of how things are related. And so when you understand how things are related, it's only then that you really understand those things. And this is important because there's a few things that we want from our data. We want it to be intuitive. As an organization, the more difficult it is for everybody to understand what's going on, the less we'll be able to work in cross-functional teams, we'll be able to work together and collaborate, and, the more, and that will slow down how we move forward. We need our data to be fast. We need our analytics and our understanding of our data to be available immediately, if, you know, ideally, at least. And we need it to be flexible because our business requirements constantly change. You know, we can't end up in situations where, like with Craigslist, you know, if you have so many columns, they have so much data in their tables that if they were to add one more column, it wouldn't finish in our lifetime. That's a problem. You know, when you're tied into those technical limitations, and you can't evolve your data based on new business requirements, that will really handicap you as we move into this age of kind of humans and machines collaborating together and seeing more AI, real AI and machine learning start to come online. Um, it's very primitive to date, but you know, give it 10 years. So, and then context. Context is king. If you don't understand how things are related in the context of those relationships, you don't really understand that entity. And then ultimately, we want to be able to drive intelligence. So we started here way back, completely disconnected. The relational databases promised that it would connect the data, but the foreign key references really didn't do that. It just gave us a link to say these two things are related, but it didn't really give us good context about it. And it was inefficient because it re relied on join pain, or joins, which kind of stopped working after you 
bring you know three, four, five things together. And then NoSQL went even further, you know, with big column and key value and document. None of those are really about the connections uh, in the data. And so those resulted in a lot of a lot of pain because it was complex to model how things were connected, uh, model and store those relationships. It didn't use or it used indexes for connecting data. Now, anytime you're using an index for connecting data, it's going to be slow after a while because indexes are fast if you're just doing a direct put and retrieve, like give me this thing back. But if you have to connect multiple things, you start building this uh, larger Cartesian product and it becomes a very slow operation, which is what everybody knows is join the panel. Um, queries get very, uh, and, and so that's why you see the decrease with increased data. Queries get long and complex and maintenance is painful. So we need a native graph database to really give us good insights because our data is actually a graph. When you sit down and think about, and we'll go through some examples here, you model the world, you model your business, you model those interactions with a customer, with your supply chain, your suppliers, uh, whatever aspect of your business it is, you'll find that it's, it's really a graph and you need to understand the context of how those things are related and the patterns in it is where you derive much of your insight and meaning. So let's get a basic kind of business level understanding of, of the graph. Uh, a graph models people, places, and things. So in this case, the little circle is your node. That's your, you know, we have a person, so we can apply a label. So we have a label. That lets us provide some context. Now a label could be driven by a knowledge ontology, which you may have heard about here uh, at some of the different talks. But um, whether it's backed by that or just, you know, kind of a schema that you've defined or a definition of uh, your <clears throat> your knowledge model, it's going to have some meaning. And so that's that's the node in the graph. And we, in addition to the person, we have the hotel and the room. The next thing that we do is we have edges. And we give those edges types. So contextual, basically that's what provides your contextual relevance. So in this case, we know that this person prefers this hotel, and this hotel has available rooms. Very intuitive. And what you see here, uh, you know, ultimately goes into uh, goes into the database. But now we need additional. We need to be able to store metadata, right? So nodes can have properties. So my person has the name Jane Smith. Those are properties in the graph. And then she prefers this hotel. And we took a note here that she was asked for that preference. You know, maybe through some survey or something that went out, some touch point that we had with our customer. Uh, in February of uh, 2018. And she, this name of the hotel is the Western Chicago. And then as of 2.15, uh, it has available room number 2021. So the thing here is both nodes and relationships can have properties. And we'll, we'll look at why that's important. Um, so what we have here is basically the property graph model. That's how we store data. We're not gonna get into a lot of code, but it's just helpful to understand how it, the context and value that it provides. So nodes are your people, places, and things. Uh, relationships store the context of how things are connected, and the properties are your, your metadata. Uh, in this case, we have Dan loves Anne. That seems simple enough. But now if we add a weight to that edge, maybe we can say Dan loves Anne with a weight of 0.8. Okay, well, so he sounds kind of crazy about her. That's, that's pretty good. But now, what if we say Anne loves Dan with a weight of 0.2? So now the context of that whole interaction there between Dan and Anne, we know a lot more about it than we did if there was just a foreign key reference saying Dan loves Anne, you know, with a adjoining table or some connection. So being able to represent that in this simple example, I show that just to say there is a lot that you can do when you can represent contextual relationships when it comes to you know, customer personalization or walking with customers or really anything, you know, how much do we trust our data and data lineage? You know, if this data source mutated this data and it arrived at this other point and it was split here and re-aggregated back together, do we really trust this data? We can put confidence on edges. And those things are valuable as you get into more machine learning, those types of algorithms. You want to be able to understand the edges and take those into account as you're, you know, going through uh, <clears throat> making those decisions. So a few of the benefits that you get from a native graph 
it's easy to model and store relationships, and it uses pointers to do traversal. That's the key difference between data stores that, uh, that we've looked at in the NoSQL space or even graph layers that sit on top of existing SQL data stores. They only use indexes to move through the data. With a native graph, um, specifically open, Neo for, open source Neo4j, so it's an open source graph database uh, that we use, um, commercial friendly license, uh, so fully open source. We build it from source. Uh, the pointers basically let you move from one node to the next. And that means that you don't have to use indexes to do traversal. So if you have a large network, millions of nodes, whether I'm one level deep, if I'm going, if I pulled myself out of the graph and I was looking at my node and I went one hop away to my immediate network and then maybe another hop to my colleagues and kind of kept hopping out through that network. If I was one level away or a million levels away, it would take the same amount of time to go from one node to the next. And so that's where having a tool that's designed to work with highly connected data gives you an advantage because that's ultimately what we're trying to do with these big data warehouses is we want to be able to bring all of our data sources together and we want to get them connected. We want to be able to look at uh, the data across them. And so that's a, the, being able to traverse in that manner becomes a huge advantage. Um, queries are shortened and more readable and adding additional properties and relationships can be done on the fly. So we don't have the problem of adding that column and needing to you know, have it not finish in our lifetimes. Uh, so easy to model. Uh, this is a big one. Graphs really connect not just the data, but the whole organization. When, when, we, when, we walk, when I can walk into an organization and I can start drawing on the whiteboard and talk about the data concepts that are important to that organization and have the CEO and the sysadmin all, and everybody in between understand the concepts that are being talked about and agree on it, that really breaks down the walls. Because often there are you know, barriers where it's like, okay, well, we're gonna go figure out the technical, we kinda hear what you want in business, we're gonna go build it, and then this is just a lot of back and forth, misunderstandings, a lot of cycle time. It doesn't let you move as quickly as you want as a business. And so what we found is that when your organization embraces connected data with graph technology like this, you can break down the barriers and you can get to the solution of how things are connected, how your business actually thinks about that data, why it's valuable for your business, and move forward much more rapidly. Uh, relationships are first class citizens, so in that easy to store manner. When I say traversal, I'm simply talking about I can go from this node across the relationship to the next node. And so you go from supplier, to product, to category, to order, employee, you kind of hop through that network. That's a traversal, every node movement. Um, so because relationships are first class citizens, and they get their own type and you can put properties on them, you can start to do really interesting things like, you know, if you're valuing a brother of relationship, or sorry, I should say, if you're valuing an employee, you know, if an employee, somebody, if a person is an employee of an organization, that's a very different type of relationship than if a person is an owner of an organization, um, specifically in maybe compliance areas. Uh, and as the graph scales and grows, that performance doesn't decrease. Uh, so, in this example, we're just going to show a quick visual of adding additional properties. Um, so these are, you know, adding additional properties and relationships can be done on the fly. And, you know, so in this case, if initially what we had was just, we have this person, they purchased this mixer, we had their home delivery address, we had their location, uh, and we had the purchase history and the category. Well, so far we've connected some of the pieces of data that we have across our operational systems. but you know, if we want to add in connections to the different promotions that we've sent out or different, you know, items that have been returned, uh, all we do is start drawing those relationships. We don't have to do any massive data migrations. We can load in the promotions data, we can load in the returns data, or just the metadata for that. We don't have to actually move all of the data. And then we can start connecting them into this customer. And we can take it even a step further. Maybe we want to understand their social interactions you know, complaints they've made, reviews they've left, tweets, emails where they've mentioned us using some natural language processing. We can drop it into the graph and start connecting it to this customer. No data migrations, just new relationships, new properties as we go forward. So a quick example here. Um, 
What you see on the left is a complex uh, join in SQL for basically finding a reporting chain within an organization. So if you want to know, okay, this person reports to this person, reports to this person, so on. Uh, takes a lot in SQL to do it. But in the native graph, it's a much more intuitive language where you can simply, I mean, you, you, because of the, you don't pay a penalty for doing depth-based queries where you, you know, there's no sense of joining things together. You can simply say, okay, match some, some person that manages other people, get the reporting chain, and then return, return that reporting chain. And it's a very simple thing. And so this is a simple query to write. So this really improves developer productivity. We've been building around graph for about six years now. And there are, it's, it's done a few things as an organization. It's allowed us to solve problems that we couldn't solve previously, just because we hit limitations. And it's made our developers much more efficient. We've been able to, uh, we've seen a, a huge increase. And you spend less time uh, doing what we were doing before, which you know, SQL developers, just so you can get, get an understanding and an appreciation for kind of this process, um, this is what most data looks like in your systems today, from SQL Server to Oracle to et cetera. Um, so you have some information. And then as a good SQL developer, you basically want to kind of normalize that so you don't end up with too much duplication. So you go through this process of normalizing it. Uh, and then you can reference those IDs. So those are your foreign keys. Obviously, the 17, 12, 19, those are your foreign keys. Uh, and then you create another table. Uh, this time, the name, the president, the state. And you reference those. So you're going through this normalization process. And you get them separated out. So you don't have all that duplication of data. Uh, but now you want to return something that actually is useful. So I want to bring uh, you know, the name, the country, the leader, the university, the state, kind of all of this together. So now you're left doing joins. And what these joins are, and the way to think about this from the business perspective, is really, it looks like this. So every time you do a join, you have some table where you have to go get data, and then you have to go find your other location and pull it out, and now you have to create the intersection between those so that you can bring them together. And so that can be a very slow process. Uh, from the technical perspective, you have to do too much of that. But it also leaves your developers just thinking about, okay, which drawer am I pulling out? Where am I getting the properties? night and day, they're just thinking about joins. And so then ultimately we end up in performance issues, and so we shove all the data back together into one big table so that we can just go to it and bring it back, create a view, because otherwise we don't get the performance. So switching over to, to graph, to the connected data, we take this table where we have the name, the country, the leader, the hair, the university, uh, president of the university and the state, and it sounds very much like English. Uh, and so we can just talk through it. So we have this person that went to the university. Uh, this person lives in a country. The state's located in, or the university is located in a state, which is located in the country. The university is led by a leader. Well, now that makes a, a whole lot of sense. You know, if you're, if you're thinking about the data and what data you're trying to get and trying to understand and be efficient in your process of building applications to you know, enable the enterprise to do more, with the data that they have. And so what that looks like uh, practically for your, for your developers is you have match some person, so I have my person reference up there, went to some university, person lives in a country led by the leader located in the state. I'm not thinking about the joins and where I have to, which, which property keys are gonna line up in order to get the right data set to come back, but I can just navigate through the graph and through the network of that data. And so you can write very complex queries very quickly. And because it's very intuitive, I've found that there's less testing cycles, less, uh, it's been less error prone, um, and so on. And so, recognizing graph problems. How do we know if we have a graph problem? Well, we're seeing graph problems across uh, just about every industry. Um, there's Oops. Uh, from finance to retail and everything in between, uh, governments, public sector, private sector. 
Uh, let's look at, at one example here, uh, analyzing traditional uh, supply chain. So, Excuse me. Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, with the graph that you're describing, um, it's, it seems like one of the advantages for a database is if I need to extract a lot of data that meets some specific criteria, right? Like, for example, let me, I've got 20,000 employees, let me pull out the 10,000 that, um, you know, joined this year, whatever, joined the company this year. <clears throat> if I have a graph, um, do I have all of that? I guess, like, I'm seeing, the, I'm seeing your point about these, these specific searches for a specific piece of information. What about when I'm looking for large aggregates amount of data? Does that make sense? Yeah, so what are you you're looking for patterns across across a data set? Yeah, you know, I, know that, I know that databases typically put a lot of work into, you know, uh, search keys. We, we want to make it fast and we need mm -hmm. to search through large amounts of data and sift through it, right? Yeah. And, and I guess adding a column is Obviously, not <clears throat> the fastest operation, but searching through large amounts of data, that's, that's supposed to be something that they're optimized for. How do, you, how, do you search, how do you search through large amounts of data? Is a graph the best way to do that for, for that type of operation? Or maybe a more generic question. Are the, you, you mentioned operations for which the graph is better than the database, are there operations for which the database is better than the graph? Yeah, um, so, so for operations where you have uh, no connect, where you're looking at a single table and connections to that table don't matter and you just want to do some operation within the table, the table will likely be faster. Um, but that's rarely the, the world that we see uh, and live in, where, you wanna, where you're looking at something in isolation. Uh, and the, the graph provides indexes to find your starting point and to find uh, logical subgraphs, meaning when you use labels, so I could give a node the person label. So in that example, um, all nodes that are persons will be indexed, maybe based on a name, based on some other whatever properties on there that are interesting to me. And I can go and pull that as my starting subgraph. So if I'm doing an analysis, I don't have to look at all the people. And maybe further, we additionally add a label of actor and director. And so if I'm interested in only the actors, only the directors, I can start my, I can run my query match some actor and now it's only going to look at that subgraph. So it, it uses indexes to find its starting point, but not to do traversal and not to connect data. And that's the key distinction. And the graph is a database. So, you know, Open Neo4j is a fully asset compliant transactional database that we build on as, you know, for new initiatives as our source of truth data store. Um, simply because we don't have systems that we're building where connectivity between things isn't important. Um, but there are operations like that where if you're just you know, summing a column or doing some analysis within a single table that it may be a little faster. Um, so logistics, when, when we look at a, around our organization, how do we see if there are, there are graph problems? Um, so in this case, if we start out and we're looking at just our sales channels. We have our web store, our mobile, and our physical stores. And we have some customer that we're tracking. And additionally, we have our supply chain, products, marketing, CRM, and payments. Well, as soon as you find yourself starting to ask questions where boy, you want to go across the, uh, you know, connect data from the web store or the mobile or your physical stores to your supply chain, you find yourself moving from, okay, I'm up here, now I'm coming down through and I want to connect this other data source. Um, um, you can basically start to navigate through that. You're starting to see that there's a graph problem because you have many different data sources which will each have a different representation of the customer, but you want to be able to take you know, 
data from your storefronts, from your shipping, from your products, uh, you know, from marketing, uh, from your uh, CRM, and from your payments, and be able to start to look at all of that together and basically you know, want to connect and cross-connect your data to do broader analysis, broader understanding, and to have it be more of a living system. See, for us, these, this data, we see it as living. It's constantly changing. Your customers aren't, aren't standing still. They're not buying what they bought yesterday, tomorrow. They're on some journey. So you want to be able to understand why they're buying what they're buying, why they're doing what they're doing, what they didn't like, what their trends are, what they're interested in. And to do that, and to provide that more personalized experience, you do have to take the data points across all of these things. And so the different analysts and data scientists that I talk to, most of the things that they're struggling with and the time that they're spending is just, you know, with their data lake, uh, data lakes and Tableau is trying to, you know, connect this, connect that, bring it into a state where they can look at and consider, you know, oh, how this product, you know, does the product rating matter for this person and what they buy? Are, you know, is their, their social network really important? You know, are there influencers within their network that influence what they buy? Um, those types of uh, different connections. And so when you're looking in your organization for graph-based problems, you really want to listen to the words uh, that engineers, other teams are using. If you hear them saying, oh, well, we'll need to you know, do some connection across this, si this data source, this data source, this data source, or this silo, we need to get them in. You're starting to hear graph-based language where you should, should trigger and you should say, okay, we have a connected data problem. We've got all this data in all of our operational stores, but in order to make, derive better insights and actually make decisions, we have to have it connected. And so then what's really, um, can be, well, we'll get into some, I'll cover that next section here. So, so there's a lot of companies that are using graph today. Um, I just wanted to throw this up here quick. And then I'm gonna go through some use cases. Uh, that can help understand some of the different connected data problems. Um, so real-time recommendations. Um, this is a this is one that we've done quite a bit in. Where you know, if I'm looking at a customer, um, you know, other similar cluster customers, you can start to derive. Well, what is a good recommendation? Um, you know, is it just customers who viewed this also viewed that? Uh, if they bought this but then returned it, you know, it's kind of that whole customer view. If, you know, if a customer bought a black shirt, doesn't mean that the customer just wants to be recommended a dozen other black shirts. You know, maybe if they bought a pair of Nike shoes, you should understand: Are they a runner? Are they a walker? What are their interests? Are they training for a marathon? Um, when you have the connected data and you have those different interests and availabilities, you can start to do uh, really useful recommendations that don't just feel like you kind of took some data and threw it out there and hoping that it would, it would stick and be interesting to the, to the customer. Because, I don't know, at least myself as a user, I am um, very aware of you know, what Amazon shows me and what other sites show me. And I look at that and I'm just like, you didn't really think this through, or it feels like that very, very often. And so then that hurts the bottom line because you lost the opportunity to show me something that I'm actually interested in. Uh, metadata man management's a big one, uh, especially you know, for organizations that have many operational data stores that you're not touching, and, but that you're not gonna touch, but that you still need the uh, information, out, you need the metadata around what's there and how it connects to other things in order to make better decisions. So maybe it, maybe it is that supply chain where you have some orders that are coming in, but you don't know how to connect back the parts that went into it, or uh, you have you know, customer and marketing information over here, and you have other um, you know, financial payment information over there, and you really want to connect that. Well, you don't want to actually necessarily move all of that data, but you can create a mapping with a graph, so you can use it as more of a metadata strategy. Um, or even, uh, yeah, metadata. So then another one uh, would be fraud detection. So uh, 
we do quite a bit in the financial space as it relates to uh, different different fraud use cases. Uh, in this example, you know, the fraudsters have evolved. They know that certain accounts trigger uh, anomalous behavior when you know from the machine learning algorithms that are just doing regressions or looking at certain bands of what is normal. And so they've learned how to stay inside of those. But uh, what the graph can let you do is it can let you look at a network of accounts. You can see many individuals, many credit cards, many uh, addresses and identities, and when you start to see patterns where, oh, these two individuals are actually using the same credit card with a different address and a different social security number, well, now that's something we should probably take a look at, because that's very different. But if you were looking in isolation of just transactions, uh, those accounts wouldn't flag or trigger anything really different. So. That gives you the opportunity. The graph kind of exposes that by connecting the data. It becomes almost uh, humorously apparent. You're like, oh, well, of course, that doesn't look right. Um, but until that data is in that connected state and kind of on a continuous basis where both humans and machines can continue to learn from it, you don't end up with you know, a real, uh, real value prop. Because if you had just an analyst doing some research and pieced together this information and then connected it to generate the report, but then it all went away. Nobody else can use that, the fact that this was found and connected in an ongoing manner. And so what the graph gives you is it lets you actually use it in an ongoing manner as part of your evolving enterprise um, knowledge, awareness, and intelligence. Uh, so for this one, graph-based search uh, writes on media content that we consume are very complex. Uh, in this case, you know, if an airline is flying over, uh, depending on the state or the country, they may have the right to make some, cat some content available in their catalog and some not. And so you know, graph-based search can navigate through all of those rights very easily to understand you know, maybe what's the best content to provide to users based on what we know about them from what they've watched last time, assuming that we have their seed information, et cetera. Network management, so IT infrastructure, this is definitely a graph. Uh, if you want to do complex analysis of, okay, we have to take out this piece of hardware, have to replace it, take it down for maintenance, what's the impact? What's downstream of it? You know, do we have a route where we can keep service up if we take this out? Or you know, even just what's our liability? You know, understanding, oh, if you know, there's a breach Cybersecurity issues, somebody breaches our network. Uh, they're in this system, we know that systems, we need to quarantine it, what's gonna be the broader, broader impact through the network, what other systems could they have had access to, uh, those types of, of use cases. Uh, identity and access management. Uh, this was actually my first graph use case back in 2011, um, doing a complex media cloud. Uh, so basically managing the workflow from many different vendors, how you, you know, take the mezzanine, get it down res for promo and kind of all the different assets, managing uh, everybody bringing it together. Because today the, uh, I guess the roles that we have in an enterprise, if you're a sysadmin on one team, doesn't necessarily mean you should have God access on another team. You know, it can be very team-based. And so those complexities don't typically fit well with uh, existing Active Directory structures uh, or LDAP. Um, so the next three use cases are some that we've uh, basically looking at when the shape of your data fits the technology that you're using, what can be possible? So for this one, in this case, the business was in the buy or the organization was in the business of buying and selling online advertising. And their reality was they had a maximum of one hour to update their bids. So this is if you're buying and selling online advertising, you have to constantly change your bid, how much you're gonna pay for it, what's it worth, what are we gonna get from buying that spot so that we can insert an ad into it. Uh, the original technical implementation was a three terabyte SQL store. Uh, <clears throat> and they were relying on distributed, federated, and highly indexed views just to get under an hour, but at a certain point, it started taking more than an hour, and that was costing them uh, lots of money, and so that's uh, bad for business. 
Um, so as we went in there and we started looking at the different signals they were looking at, the sites, the structures, how they were making decisions, uh, we started to build out a graph model around it and we realized that it was just these joins that were killing them. And as they had all of these, uh, even the federated queries across many distributed store, they just couldn't get the answers quickly enough. Um, when we migrated the data into NEO, it actually reduced the data size because they no longer had so many replicas of all the data. So it brought it down to about a terabyte. And we were running on about 10% of the original hardware. And then we paired that with Elasticsearch. So we, uh, within GraphGrid, we have auto-indexing between the graph and Elasticsearch so you can leverage real, you know, plain text to search into it uh, and then kind of for um, you know, rapid cache type uh, access for certain things. But it was bringing through over 2 billion nodes and edges per day, so really high throughput. But the ultimate result was that we got it down to taking less than 300 milliseconds. So from over an hour to 300 MS. And that starts to make a huge difference in just you know, the cost of the business to operate, and then even what you can do. You can start to consider more signals in your decision making, take into account more properties, and start focusing on what are the better, uh, better decisions that we could be making, or what are better outcomes. Another one here, selling complex content packages. So uh, studios, media producers, they produce a lot of content. And in this one scenario, uh, they had their sales team, it would take about four to six hours just to get an answer. So if you're trying to negotiate with Netflix and you want to sell them a package of content, you're going to have content in your catalog that's really desirable, and then you're going to have content in your catalog that's been there for years that you make a much higher margin on. So a lot of the new content, you don't get to make nearly as much margin. And so there's a package that you put together where you try to put together something that's you know, beneficial for the uh, content producer, but also um, interesting enough to whoever's buying that the rights to play that back. So in this case, in order to know if a package could be sold, the sales rep had to submit that package to the system and it would take four to six hours to run a query and return a result. That's really hard to negotiate and have a kind of fluid business process if you're trying to do that. Uh, and in order to get it down to the four to six hours, they were generating a billion row hash tables. Uh, and there were only one or two uh, experts in the world that could actually work on that or knew how that stored procedure worked. And so that just screams business liability uh, all over the place. <laughs> um, so when we started looking at it, we saw it was very, with all the different attributes and considerations and you know, content that made certain margins, which ones were better for the business to include, which ones uh, could be desirable or similarity, you know, doing similarity between content and looking at better margins. So if you know, Netflix asks for this, but we have this other piece that's kind of like that, that their users should like, but we make much better margin on, let's recommend that instead. Um, so we started looking at all of those things, and we loaded the data, <clears throat> got it in using Neo4j Elasticsearch, uh, and then took it a step further to actually look at, so that, that brought it down to sub-second. So with under a second, we could go from something that was four to six hours, returning in under a second. And then what that allows you to do is start to introduce more dynamic interactions for the sales team. So now we're looking at an AI recommender system that can assist the sales team. Because if you're an individual and you, don't, you, know, you have 100,000 items in the catalog, well, you don't know which ones are best suited to put into a particular package based on the rate and based on how much margin the company makes. But now if you have uh, an AI negotiator that's assisting the sales team, they can be on the phone and they can be playing with a package you know, uh, builder and say, okay, well, what if we put this in? Um, and so that, was, that really changed the game. Because when you can go from something that's an OLAP process down to something that's real time, it really changes the way uh, individuals work and the way that organizations function. Um, so in this case, this is a data lineage use case. Uh, working in a highly regulated uh, financial institution, global financial, uh, took Oracle and it had data lineages that weren't finishing. And then um, an example scenario of what becomes possible uh, when we fit those lineages, because data lineages are basically you have 3,000 applications and you're moving, maybe you have however many applications you have, and you're moving data from one to the next. And then you want to understand where, um, you know, how do I trust this data, who modified it, and kind of what that whole path looks like. And so in this case, uh, we went from not finishing to finishing in the most complex lineages in under a minute. So Oracle was essentially 
For the comp simple lineages, it, it could finish, but for the complex ones, it just fell over. And in this case, uh, we were able to get it down to under a minute. And uh, yeah, it was great. Uh, last one here. So we actually build our graph cloud um, on a graph. So we use it for all of our infrastructure management. So we represent our entire network in the graph. We use it to make uh, intelligent, informed decisions about you know, uh, the different resources that we're utilizing, uh, how things are working, basically all of the graph operations across the infrastructure from our brokers to our um, different instances. Everything is represented in the graph, and it gives it a very, uh, let's just do a lot of very interesting, interesting things. Uh, and kind of lastly here, um, the reason we built our graph cloud is because we saw that connected data needed to be available for the general enterprise. Kind of the original ones that you would think of, you know, when you're looking to derive intelligence and gain competitive advantage, the ones that come to mind are you know, obviously Google with their search intelligence. What they did is, that was a graph, is they said, let's not just index the pages, but let's look at how the pages connect. That's their page rank, right? So you're like, oh, this page connects to this page, connects to this page. They have had that proprietary graph technology that allowed them to replace all the Vista, et cetera, and really dominate the search market until today. Uh, Facebook, similarly, they have the social intelligence. They understand us, how we're connected to pe other people in our lives, the things that we like, the things, uh, places we work, places we eat, they understand so much about us. Uh, and so that, even though they don't necessarily use it, yeah, so that, that was that connected data advantage that they get. And then LinkedIn with their labor intelligence. They understand where we all work, where we've worked in the past, what our roles are, what, are, you know, what we say we're good at, who recommends us, who we're connected to. And now that they're in Microsoft, they're starting to leverage a lot of that with new, uh, new capabilities that they're they're putting out there to you know, help people find, find jobs that are desirable and, and whatnot. But they understand the labor, they understand how we work, who we work for, what we do. Uh, and they leverage that, that connected aspect of it uh, very well in getting their, their competitive advantage. And so I think every enterprise needs to be able to leverage that type of uh, connected data in the future to really thrive and grow, uh, and especially to integrate it as the foundation of artificial intelligence and machine learning, because unless you have a knowledge asset that you're curating where your humans can understand what's there, you can't expect machines to do well with it. Uh, and that's all the material I have planned. So take questions.